Good morning. morning. You guys doing all right? All right. You glad you're here? It's been quite the day, hasn't it? Great time in worship. Got to see a baptism. Uh, Had a baptism in 9 a.m. service as well. And so I'm pretty sure that puts us right at 60 for the year of 2017, 60 baptisms so far this year. Uh, And so we are rejoicing. You didn't clap for that. That means your hands are broken, whatever. And uh, we're rejoicing in what God is doing uh, in this season at BT. Why don't you do me a favor, grab your Bible if you have it with you, take it out as you do so, say hi to someone next to you that you didn't come with and say you're glad they're here. Just one person, you know, you you did this last week, you took forever. All right. Back to your seats. Come on. Sit down, Ralph. Let's go. Come on. All right. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Last week, we started a new series, and you saw the title in the video, Complete in Christ. And what we're doing is we're doing a nine-week study of the book of Colossians. It's a short book in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul, and I shared this last week, so if you missed last week, I'll give you help. If you hear the word Colossians, you're like, man, I don't know. I brought a Bible, but I don't know where that is. I'll tell you what I told last week. You get your Bible, and you go right to the middle. You're going to be somewhere around the book of Psalms, okay? And you just go like this. And you're going to find the book of Matthew. And then Romans. And then probably Hebrews. And then you just start going back the other way, all right? So anyways. So we're in the book of Colossians. We're in chapter 1. It's a nine-week study. Last week, we looked at verses 9 through 14. We skipped the first eight verses. They're introductory comments from the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae. This book is a letter, right? And so we said last week, anytime we're going to study a letter, we should know a little bit about the person writing it, the people receiving it, maybe why he wrote it. And so we, we shared last week, and let me say this, if you missed last week, get online or get on the app and watch it, because I shared a lot of background information last week that I don't have time to repeat today, and it'll help make sense as to why we're studying this letter. The, but, but, but this short, powerful book, what I want to say, uh, just a quick recap, is Paul wrote this book, and one of the main uh, points he makes is the supremacy of Jesus. Now, we don't use the word supremacy a lot in our vocabulary, but if you think about it, it's a great word. It's the highest value. It's that Jesus is supreme in all things. And one of the main reasons Paul was writing about this supremacy of Jesus, if you will, is because the believers in Colossae, right, the the, the town where Coloss- the Colossian church was, the believers in Colossae, as I shared last week, were surrounded by a false teaching called Gnosticism. And if you're going to write that down, it starts with a G, Gnosticism. And Gnostics, followers of Gnosticism, just a quick recap, they believed that there was this higher, superior, secret knowledge to life and the universe and existence and spirituality this secret superior knowledge that could be attained by human effort. And so they were pushing this, right? You know, you just got to know more. You got to do the right things. And one of the big problems with Gnosticism was that there was no way, according to a Gnostic, that Jesus was God. They knew who Jesus was. They knew he was enlightened. But there's no way he was God because to a Gnostic, for God to put on flesh would make God less than and God would never be less than when the goal is always to be more than, right? You want to you climb the ranks and get more knowledge. And, and so that was, you, you follow, that was a false teaching. And so Paul writes the Colossian church saying, no, no, don't listen to the Gnostics. It's not a secret knowledge. This knowledge is for anyone who trusts Jesus Christ. There, there is a higher knowledge, but it's not secret. And you can't get it on your own. You've got to get it from Jesus. The whole sermon last week is that we can't do it. Amen. All right. And and so Paul's writing, and what we're going to see in the passage today, verses 15 to 23, he's writing in these verses today about how all-surpassing in value Jesus is, the bigness of Jesus. But he doesn't just talk about the bigness of Jesus. Paul actually tells us there's a purpose to the bigness of Jesus. And my prayer today and for this whole series is is that for all of us, no matter where we are on the spiritual spectrum, that today the Lord would speak to our hearts. He's already spoken to mine in this text. And he would reveal to us areas that we need more completeness in Christ. Because all of us continue to grow in our faith. For some of us today, today will be your day of salvation, I believe. For some people today, you will, you will confess Jesus as Savior. You'll walk in newness of life. But for all of us, there's going to be a next step today in understanding our completeness 
in Christ. And what we're going to do is look at how big Jesus is. I'm going to warn you now. My wife told me this earlier. She's right. This is a deep. Everybody do this real quick. Everybody do this. Hold your nose. Okay, now you're ready because we're going to go deep today, right? We're going deep in the water. <laughs> you're, going, you're underwater. Anyways, and, and so we're going deep today. But it, I, I promise if you stay with me, we're going to end up in a very practical place. And so we're going to dive into these waters today. In Colossians chapter 1, some powerful verses in verses 15 to 23 so we can, we can see how Jesus' bigness affects our lives. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image, he's speaking of Jesus here, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Everybody say the word preeminent. Preeminent. All right, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Do you see how Paul is addressing that Gnostic belief right there? Gnostics say, God would never put on flesh and make himself less than. And here Paul says, don't listen to the Gnostics, because in the person of Jesus, God with flesh on, God the Father was pleased to have his fullness dwell inside that, that, that co- combination of humanity and deity. So he's attacking the Gnosticism there. Verse 20, and through him, so God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we spend these next few moments in your word, I pray that you would speak clearly into our hearts. God, I pray that you would illuminate for all of us what our next step can be today. God, I pray for those that have trusted Jesus for salvation, but they're not trusting him for today. They're not trusting him for that marriage problem. They're not trusting him for that financial struggle, that that job situation, that feeling of hopelessness, that health concern, those dreams and aspirations. God, I pray that we would trust you fully today. Father, I pray for those that have come in here. Maybe they're in this room or in overflow or even watching online. And Father, the truth is they may know a little bit about you, but they have yet to know you personally through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today through the preaching of your word that you would draw those people to yourself, that today would be the day of salvation, that newness of life would would be granted today. Father, I pray that we would be encouraged by your word. I pray that you would be glorified in this time of preaching. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we saw here in verse 19, that word, that, uh, verse 18, I'm sorry, that word I had you, you say aloud. Verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And so preeminent's another word like supremacy that we don't use a whole lot, but I'm going to tell you why we should today. Really, the title of the sermon, if you saw it in the worship notes, it's the preeminent person and purpose of Jesus Christ. And preeminent, while it sounds fancy, Uh, While it sounds maybe hard to understand, what preeminent literally means, preeminent means this simply according to Webster's Dictionary. It means surpassing above all others. Make sense? If something is preeminent, pre that that prefix first and imminent, it's, it's surpassing, it's in first place. It's not good, it's not better, it's not even best, it's bestest, right? Making up words for it. Surpassing above all others. And so with that definition in place, what I want to do is just move step by step, verse by verse, through verses 15 to 23, and look at the preeminent person of Jesus, the fact that the person of Jesus is surpassing above all others. That's what we're going to get deep. We're going to look at how big Jesus is. But then we're going to make it practical because then we're going to jump into the surpassing above all others purpose of Jesus. This is what I'm saying. I hope this makes sense. There's a purpose to the bigness of Jesus. There's a method to the magnitude, if you will. 
And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to start off looking at the person. And so the question is, who is the preeminent person? Who is the preeminent person of Jesus? And so I start in verse 15 where it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And the first thing that that screams out to me in verse 15 is that the preeminent person of Jesus is not an add-on. He's not something in addition to. He's not just something else, another self-help guru, another possible explanation. I love what it says in verse 15. It says, he is the image of the invisible God. If you study the Old Testament, you'll find that in Hebrew thought, it was well understood that God was invisible, right? Now, we see in Genesis, we see in Genesis that it says God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, and I personally believe he physically walked with him. Now, we could have a great discussion one day, not today, about who that, who that was. Maybe that's the second person of the Trinity, Jesus already walking in the garden. But, but in the Old Testament, we come to understand that God is invisible, but here in the New Testament, we get this, we see Jesus put on flesh, he obviously becomes visible, and then Paul makes this, this connection, he says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And that word image, <clears throat> it means icon or portrait. It, it, it's similar to this, when, when someone, maybe back in the day, and some people still do this today, they're going to seal an envelope instead of you know, licking it and getting that nasty taste in their mouth. And if it's not the little pull strip ones, or, you know, they, they get wax and they seal it with wax, right? You have this blob of wax. Have you seen it happen? You, you have this blob of wax and you have a seal. Maybe it's like the, the last initial of someone's name. And they press that seal into the wax. And what does it leave on the wax? An impression or an imprint. Do you see how beautifully this is connected? Jesus is the imprint of the Father. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we become the imprint of Jesus. See, he's the, I, he's, the, he's the image. You know, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> there's this thing called the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. Maybe you've read them. Maybe you've never read them, but you saw Charlton Heston play Moses in the Ten Commandments. Or if that's a little too dated for you, maybe you saw Prince of Egypt, right? Any, has anybody in any way, is anybody in any way aware of the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. You've heard of them. You've read them. You've seen the movies. All right, most of us. I'm not saying you can recite them all, okay? And, and so we know how it goes, right? Thou shalt not, bop, 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 right? And so one of those famous thou shalt nots, God says this to the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus. He says, thou shalt not have any graven, carved image of me, of God. You're not going to have any, any carved out image. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, you could study the Old Testament and see that that was a temptation back then. But you could wonder, he, God's listing the, the ten biggies, right? And seriously, one of the ten biggies is don't, don't carve gods? Like, I mean, I know we shouldn't do that, but surely there's got to be a bigger ten that didn't make the list, right? Like, I mean, like don't perform acts of terrorism. That, that, you know, maybe there's something else he could have done. Until you look at the whole picture, you know why God was so adamant? To the nation of Israel, which by the way, the Ten Commandments come and apply to us. You know why I was so adamant to say, you shall not have any engraven, any carved image of a God. You know why? Because some 1,500 years after Moses would receive that, you know what happened? Jesus became the carved image of God. He became the carved out in the flesh, image of God, where no image would ever be needed again. Beloved, you don't need to see God in the sky. You don't need to see God in a tortilla. You don't need to see God in some, I mean, whatever. And God speaks in a multitude of ways. But Jesus is the perfect final image of the invisible Father. He's been carved out of the likeness because he is God himself. He's not some ad. That's what we do in our Western society, though. And I don't just mean Western society as a whole. We know that the majority of our, of our country, when polled, says they're Christian, and there's just no way that's true. <clears throat> but I don't mean Western society generally. I mean in our churches. How many times in our churches is Jesus just an add-on? You say, well, Chris, how do I know if he's an add-on? I'm glad you asked. Jesus is an add-on when in our blessings and our struggles, he's not the first person we acknowledge. 
And so when you succeed in business and you make good money and you, and you thrive and you grow and, and, and you accomplish or whatever it is, you know, you succeed and you think, well, you know, it's my, I worked hard. You know, I earned it. I got good family genes. I came from the right stock. I accomplished. Oh, and by the way, maybe somewhere along the way, Jesus sprinkled some Jesus pixie dust on me and kind of helped me out. But really, I did it. If there is anything in your life, which all of us have something, by the way, to be thankful for, and the first person of thanks is not Jesus, he's an add-on to you. Here's another thing. If you are not thankful, if you think, well, don't worry, that's not me, Chris, because I don't have enough to be thankful for, guess what? He's an add-on to you because you don't think his provision is sufficient. If in our struggles, our first response is mom, dad, spouse, kids, Christian brother or sister, counselor, all good sources... But if our first response is not on our knees in prayer before the Father, guess what? He's an add-on. And our society has built a culture of God just being something else. But he is the image. He's the image. He's the, the image of the surpassing above all others, most holy God. And so if he's not an add-on, then the natural question is, what in the world is he? Well, this is pretty simple. This isn't the deep part yet, okay? You're like, these are not deep statements. Just stay with me. If he's not an add-on, Jesus has to be the main thing. He is the main thing. Not something to be compartmentalized, not a cute figure to be worshipped on Sundays or Wednesdays or Sundays and Mondays, Sundays in community group. He's not a, a compartmentalized portion of our life. He is meant to be the main thing in all areas of our life. He's meant to be surpassing above all others. How is he the main thing? I'm glad you asked. Paul gives us four areas right here in the text. Paul speaks to four areas that declare the bigness of Jesus, the main thingness. I'm making up words everywhere. The main thingness of Jesus, the preeminence, the surpassing above all others. And so in the text, four areas where Jesus is clearly the main thing. Verse 16 says, for by him all things were created. And so Jesus is the main thing in creation. He has spoken everything into being. And this is where we're going to get a little deep on the bigness of God because we can look around, maybe see, you know, sunset, sunrise, creation, stars, sun, moon, and we see it. You know, sometimes I I get a little concerned because sometimes we can have a a love for the things of God over God himself. And so as Christians, sometimes we want to get in and we want to study all the supernatural, which is good. But we want to study the supernatural because it, it, it gets our focus off of God and how we can interact with him. And so this is what I'm saying. This is the bigness of God because it's not just that he's created the physical universe. He's created, as Paul says, dominions and rulers and authorities. And quite literally what that's referring to is the angelic realm. And so people want to talk about angels, right, which is fine. They're in Scripture. There's, there's, a, there's a study in theology called angelology where you study angels. A few weeks ago, we were in Isaiah chapter 6, right, and we looked at the seraphim, these massive angelic beings with six wings. They cover their face, cover their feet, and they fly. They, they cry out, holy, holy, amazing beings. But just be amazed by this, that when you read of the seraphim or you read of these angels and their pronouncements and you, you want to go deep into, man, angels, is there angels around us? And Peter says, we entertain angels unaware or whatever, and, and we want to dive into that. Remember this, when you think how big angels are, just remember that they had a beginning and it was Jesus. The only being without a beginning is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus doesn't have a start. Angels don't predate Jesus. He spoke them into existence. And so he's the main thing in creation. He's the main thing for creation. And let me explain that because verse 16 goes on to say that all things were created through him. This is the end of 16. All things were created through him and all things were created for him. And so when I say for creation, I mean creation is created for him. It's the, re- he's the, check this out, he's the goal of creation, if you will. All things are created for his pleasure. He's the goal, he's the focus, and somewhere along the way, we make God into our image instead of us being in his image, 
and we lose sight of this. And, and hear me, I'm going to say some, some truths because they're in the scripture and they may be harsh, but I, I want you to know I love you and God loves you. But here's reality. God loves all of us immensely. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you're not his child, okay? But he loves us. He loves us so much that John tells us he sent his son to die on the cross, right? And so he, he loves us and he lavishes us with love, love. He blesses us. If you received no more blessings from God, you've already received too many, okay? And so he, is, he, he has hope. He has plans for us. And he gives us his favor and all of these things. But we need to understand one very fundamental, one very important fundamental reality. We exist for the pleasure of God. He does not exist for our pleasure. We are the created being. And all of creation is for him. And so here's the harsh statement. God loves you. He is for you in this broken life. We walk through ups and downs. And when you walk through downs and you want to be arrogant enough to say, oh, God, you aren't doing what you're supposed to do, just remember you exist for him and not vice versa. But this is where it gets amazingly gracious. There's a modern-day theologian called John Piper. You should read him sometime. And John Piper issues this quote that gets used all the time. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us. He's most glorified. He's most made preeminent. You follow? Does it make sense? He is most valued in us. He's most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. What does that mean? Yes, I exist for him. And I have no, now he can handle my questions because guess what? He's preeminent. But I have no place to question him. Now, we do it. We all do it plenty of times. But this is the amazing grace of God. Yes, he's preeminent. Yes, Jesus is surpassing above all, all others. He has spoken the physical universe and the angelic realm into existence. And I exist for his pleasure. But what, what, what the Bible goes on to tell us is that when I understand this, and I am, I am, most, when I am most aware of the fact that I exist for him, this unique reality happens where I suddenly become all satisfied. Because I exist for him, but because he's gracious, he satisfies me in my pursuit of him. He satisfies me. He, he, he quenches my, my thirsts. He meets my every need. And so how is he the main thing? In creation, he's the main thing for creation. Verse 17 goes on to tells us, tell us he's the main thing by keeping creation. Look at verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is surpassing above all others. He is preeminent because he didn't just create everything, and everything doesn't just exist for him, but he actually keeps everything created. <laughs> he keeps everything created. We lose sight of this, and this is where, again, it's kind of deep. But right now, spinning planets and solar systems and galaxies and human beings breathing in and out as our lungs fill with air and then empty as we exhale. The keeping of creation is only by the will of the Father through Jesus the Son. The, the keeping of, this is what I mean, if it weren't for Jesus keeping us, we would explode. <laughs> he, he keeps us. This is one of the best ways to illustrate this. We celebrated Easter a couple weeks ago and as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we also recognize the death of Jesus. And we know the story, most of us are aware, when Jesus, although he was innocent, was handed over to Pilate to be crucified, Roman soldiers would go on to beat him, to scourge him. They would place a crown of thorns on his head. They would mock him. They would then nail him to a cross. Do you know why they did all that? Because they thought they had power over him. And what they failed to realize in the moment, they failed to realize that the, the Jesus they beat and the Jesus they mocked and the Jesus they crowned and the Jesus they nailed to the cross was the same Jesus who kept their DNA together. He was the same Jesus who made sure that their next breath happened. And now I, I believe, I personally believe, some of those soldiers got saved that day. I believe we're going to get to heaven. We're going to see some Roman soldiers. Where do you get that? This thing called the Bible. Because when Jesus gets put up on the cross, and after fulfilling all the prophecies, and he says, it is finished, into your hands I commend my spirit, some crazy things happened. If you haven't read the story, check it out. Things like the earth shook. 
Like everything's fine. It's even daylight that the Bible tells us. And then it got dark. And then there was earthquakes. And then the temple veil. And this isn't like, no, just grabbing some t-shirt. Ah, I'm the Hulk. No, this temple veil, this tapestry rips from top to bottom. Dead people walk out of their tombs. Right? So this guy, Jesus, who claims to be the son of God, Roman soldiers think they got something on him. Oh, yeah, I want to make fun of you, blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus dies. He breathes his last breath. And then suddenly, in the coming moments, the earth shakes, the veil tears, it gets dark, and dead people walk out of tombs. You see it in the text. Suddenly, the soldiers look at each other like, hmm, maybe this dude was for real. (laughs) And this is just my own, I guess you could call it my own heresy if you want. I believe some of those soldiers that day came to faith in Christ. You know, you know what they did? They went, uh-oh. <laughs> we, we, we made a mistake. Isn't that what salvation is? Uh-oh. I can't do it. And so Jesus, you catch this? He keeps creation together. He keeps the fiber of your body together. He keeps your DNA, this miles-long strand of genetic code that makes you you. Your DNA doesn't make you you. Jesus makes you you because he, he, he makes your DNA. And so he keeps creation. He's the main thing. He surpasses everything. And verse 18 tells us this, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And so he's the main thing in the church. And what Paul has done here, he's talked about Jesus being first and big in creation. He created and created, stuff's created for him and he holds it together. But what's happened now when Paul brings up the church is is Paul has gone from general things. Everybody sees creation. Everybody doesn't acknowledge creation as Jesus' work, but they see it. And they see that it's continuing, that it's somehow sustaining But Paul has now moved from general to specific, or even better yet, he has moved from impersonal to personal because he speaks of the church now. He says Jesus is the main thing. He's preeminent in everything, including the church, his bride, the body of Christ. And I love what Paul says in 18. He says he's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, let me ask you a question, and let's see, you know, just take a guess here. Maybe you know a little bit, you've read some Bible stories. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, was Jesus the first person to ever be resurrected? No. Like two, two real quick examples. It wasn't too long before this that Lazarus, Jesus' friend, had died, and Jesus shows up, and they're like, you know, in the King James, he stinketh, right? They're like, Jesus, he, Lazarus is dead, man. It, it's too late. And Jesus is like, Lazarus, come on, man. And guess what? Dead Lazarus got up and walked out of the tomb. Luke chapter 8 tells us that a guy named Jairus came to Jesus, and Jairus says, Jesus, my daughter is sick to the point of death. You've got to hurry. And so you just picture yourself in that moment. I have four children. I have one daughter. And if my daughter was sick to the point of death and I got to Jesus, I would grab him by the hand. I don't care who wanted to see him. I'm I'm just being, I don't care who, who else's kids are sick. Because my daughter is sick to the point of death. I'm grabbing Jesus by the hand. I'm like, you ain't got time to sign up. Let's go. And so Jairus is urgently trying to get Jesus to his daughter. They get held up by this pesky woman who has internal bleeding, right? You know, I'm joking. And so Jesus pauses and provides healing for this woman and then continues on his way to Jairus' house. But when he gets there, Jairus' daughter has already died. And what did people say? The translation, people said, Jesus, you're too late. This is for someone today. This is, this is the word the Lord has for you. Jesus is never too late. Okay? You have a situation that seems completely hopeless. You've been around religion your whole life, but yet you don't feel like you personally know Jesus is never too late. And so he shows up. They say, you're too late. And he goes, well, let me, let me, let me evaluate the situation. So Jesus walks into the bedroom and he takes the girl by the hand, as I've said so many times. He takes a dead girl by the hand, by the law, that makes Jesus unclean. He just touched the dead. But Jesus didn't walk out of the bedroom unclean. That little girl walked out breathing. And so Jesus is not the first resurrection. Now, there's something very different. Lazarus and Jairus' daughter, Jesus went to him. 
Nobody went to Jesus. He's the power of resurrection. And so if he's not the first resurrected person, what does it mean that he's the firstborn? What it means is that he is highest in rank of all the resurrected ones. He's, he is firstness. Let's just keep making it word. He is highest in rank. His, resur- his resurrection trumps them all. And so Jesus is the main thing in the church, in his people, in the body, because his death is the highest. His death is surpassing above all others. And I know this is deep, and maybe for some of you, you're like, oh, man, I don't even know where he's going. Now he's rambling. Check this out. Because the bigness of Jesus, the preeminence of Christ, has very practical implications for our lives. If you believe Jesus is who he says he is, what should that mean in your life? Think of all the arenas that you have in your life and what is first place in each of them. If in any arena, anything besides Jesus is first, you're missing it. And so in your family, he should have first place. Parents, your kids are for him, not for you. They've been put on loan. Treat them well. Married people, your spouse is for him, not for you. He should have first place in your family. He should have first place in your marriage. He should have first place in your vocation. He should have first place in your conversation. He should have first place in your hopes and dreams. You know what, what, what breaks my heart is the number of professing believers, people who claim to know Jesus, and they go through life defeated because they feel like God and letting them live out their dreams and their aspirations. And I just ask them, have you ever asked God what his dreams for you are? Because his dreams for you are so much better than your dreams for yourself. And so he should have first place in your dreams and your hopes. He should have first place in your finances. He should have first place in your time. And here's a soapbox moment, so I'm stepping on it just for a second. You know what breaks my heart? And I want to be careful because I'm not saying that we need to become Pharisees here and legalists. But Jesus is all surpassing. But yet the freedom, the freedom in this country for now that we have to do this right here is something we engage in while, when, when convenient. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that there's legalism and that 52 Sundays a year of perfect attendance gets you, you know, a better spot in heaven. I take, I take vacation every year and miss some Sundays. But let's be honest, what's happened in our society? What's happened, not, not our, what's happened in our churches? Church becomes something that I will be all about as long as it's all about me and convenient. And, and he should have first place in our time. He should have first place in our time. He should have first place in all of those areas and more. Because if Jesus is that big, and it's a choice to either believe him or not, but if Jesus is the preeminent, all-surpassing person, then should that person not have first place in all areas of our life? We go through life with broken dreams because we've never taken them to God. You know what happens? This is where it gets a little practical. You know what happens when we understand the magnitude of Jesus? We, we come to understand the words of Paul when he wrote to the church in Corinth. And Paul said that, you know, and Paul had been beaten and shipwrecked. I mean, this dude, he, he had a go of it. And what did Paul say? He says, but all of these things are but light, momentary afflictions. He didn't say that there are not, that there are no afflictions. And I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. My life has had plenty of downs, just like it's had plenty of ups. And there have been times in my life when I have faced the the reality of a broken world, and I've been thrown down on the ground, and what happened was that it was not a moment. It wasn't momentary. It was days and weeks and even months sometimes. But do you know why those afflictions were days and weeks and months? Because I wasn't looking at the bigness of Jesus. I was looking at the bigness of my struggles. There have also been times that this life has thrown me down. 
And it's not that the pain is not real. You know, I shared last week in the sermon, and this will probably be one of my most real personal examples for a while. I shared, you know, January 19th, when my mom passed away, guess what? That's rough. I'm mama's boy, man. I love you. But what was different, by God's grace, this isn't me, by God's grace, you know what was different? And it's not that it's not still difficult. But instead of dwelling on the magnitude of the loss of my mother, I have chosen to dwell on the magnitude of Jesus in my life. And so like Paul, I can say, even though it hurts like no other hurt, this is but a light, momentary affliction. Because he didn't end there, he gave the comparison. We can only understand that when we view it through the lens of the surpassing weight of glory. You know what happens when you view Jesus as big as he is? You view your problems as small as they really are. He's the preeminent, all-surpassing person of Jesus. But it can't stay there. It can't stay theoretical, right? It can't just be, oh, he's big, and oh, we just need to sit around and think about it. Because it's not just that he's big. This is what I love. That's what I love about God when he speaks to us through his word. There's a purpose to his bigness. There's a reason why Jesus is, is so large. That, again, as I said, there's a method to his magnitude, if you will. And it's the preeminent purpose. It's the all-surpassing purpose of Jesus. And what is the preeminent purpose? We know that Jesus says, I came to do only the will of the Father. So that's, that, that's the foundation. But as he only does the will of the Father, what is the purpose that surpasses all others? Paul makes it abundantly clear, starting in verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. What is the purpose that surpasses all other purpose for the bigness of Jesus? It's one statement. It's the mission of reconciliation. Why, is Jesus, why does the bigness of Jesus matter to me practically? Because it took the bigness of Jesus to bring me back to God. The purpose of preeminence is Reconciliation. How does Jesus accomplish it, right? It's a natural question. If the purpose is reconciliation, how does he accomplish it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Again, Paul says this in verse 20. Verse 20, he says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Verse 22 says, He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. How does Jesus accomplish this all-surpassing purpose of reconciliation? Because he makes peace by the blood of his cross. Because through his physical death, his bodily death on the cross, he's able to bring us back to the Father. His death is the means. But this is that critical moment. And if you, if you checked out, check in for a second here. It's the so what, right? We can talk about the bigness of Jesus. I love to talk about the bigness of Jesus. You, you want to talk about some nerds, you get Marshall and I together and let us talk about the appearance of Jesus. We'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> it's awesome. And talk about the how. Talk about the how of reconciliation. We can talk about the cross and all the implications. But there comes this point in time, not just Jesus is all surpassing, not just that he accomplished re reconciliation through his death, but that proverbial question that most of us know the answer to, but it's always beneficial to remind ourselves why did he do it, right? He's huge and all-surpassing. He came to accomplish reconciliation through his death, but why in the world did he do it? Why reconciliation? Well, in the text, Paul gives that answer as well. In verse 21, Paul says, after saying, making peace by the blood of his cross, Paul says, and you who once were alienated. It's on the screen. Read this verse with me. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, verse 22, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Why did he do it? There's two purposes to the why. The second one, I'll start with the second one because I'm going to spend less time there. He reconciled us. He, he died on the cross to reconcile us so he could take us to the Father and the Father would see us as blameless, above reproach. 
And only Jesus could do that. If you missed last week, watch the sermon online because the whole message last week was we can't do it. We have to come before the Father spotless. We have to come before the Father blameless, but we can't do it because we are full of blame and full of spots. We are riddled with sin. And so Jesus reconciles us, and so by reconciling us, he presents us blameless. But the first reason why that I want to spend a little more time on is what Paul starts with in verse 21. And you, and me, and you who once were alienated separated from God, not just separated from God, but even hostile towards him. We talk about this all the time. There is an epidemic in our society of people coasting through life, and their response to the question of who is Jesus to you, or, or what is your view of eternity, and how do you know you're secure, their response is, well, you know, I think I'm okay, and I'm pretty good. And the Bible is clear, no one's okay, and no one's pretty good without Jesus. And I know most of us have probably already trusted Christ, but there's this fundamental understanding that we've got to get back to because in our arrogance, we forget this. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior March 4th of 1998, and every day before that, I was separated from him. Beloved, I grew up in church with amazing church parents. I went to Sunday school and Wednesday night and Sunday night, and if it was open, I was there, and if it wasn't open, sometimes I was there anyways. I was at church all the time. But prior to that becoming personal, in March of 1998, I was separated from God, and this is where I have to remind myself, otherwise my arrogance would make me think that somehow I kind of did part of my own salvation. I wasn't just separated, I was hostile towards God. And we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that in Western thought. I'm not, what do you mean? I, I wasn't, no, before you knew Jesus, today, if you are trusting anything besides Jesus, you are hostile towards him. Well, what does that mean? I'm not a terrorist. No, no, this is what it means. Every moment of your existence that you don't trust Jesus as your savior, guess what? You are trusting yourself. And that is hostility to a holy God who died to save you. If you are thinking somehow you can on your own do a better job than the death of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, that is hostility towards God. And everyone who doesn't place their faith in Jesus for salvation, that's what they do. And we have to get back to, here's, here, this is for everyone. If you've trusted Jesus, you've got to get back to the fundamental understanding that without Jesus, you are the enemy of God. Why does he use the language that he made peace with the blood of his cross? Because without the blood of the cross, we're still at war with God. We needed a peace treaty, and Jesus signed it in his blood. And if you haven't trusted Jesus, if you don't have the full assurance of salvation today, you are trusting yourself. And you may not be purposefully doing this, but here's the reality. You are God's enemy, and you are hostile towards him because you are not, you are not recognizing the weight of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, G.K. Chesterton was a theologian in England, and the story goes that the London Times issued this editorial piece, if you will, and said, what is wrong with the world today? And G.K. Chesterton, a theologian, a pastor, if you will, he wrote in, and you know what his response was? Dear sir, I am. Respectfully, G.K. Chesterton. What did he mean? Did G.K. Chesterton mean that he was the problem with the whole world today? This is, what, this is what he was saying in those two words, I am. Apart from Jesus, I'm what's wrong with the world. Apart from Jesus, I'm what's wrong with the world because I choose my sin over him. Because of Jesus, I can have a new life, though. You know, I think a way to maybe illustrate this reality, because it's not just that we're hostile to God. I, I mean, I want to make that clear. You're like, man, you are just beating me down. Well, stay with me. It gets better. It's not just that you're hostile towards God. It's that without Jesus, we are hopeless towards God. Be, be, because we're hostile and alienated, we're, we're by default hopeless. And so I, I think of 1912, this really historic event that you've most likely heard of. If you haven't, dear Lord, we need better information systems. In 1912, you may have heard of this little boat called the Titanic. 
Okay. If you haven't, go check it out on Netflix, Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm the king of the world. Anyways. In 1912, what was dubbed the unsinkable ship, the RMS Titanic, set sail. And you know how it went. It sunk. The unsinkable ship sunk. I remember in 1997 or 8, whenever the movie came out, I was in college and I went with a group of guys and girls to see it. And I'm a very type A kind of analytical, typically, not always. But, but at the end of the movie, all the dudes and the, everybody's just boohooing. I'm like, did you not know the boat sinks? I mean, oh, but she's hanging on to the board. I'm like, yeah, why didn't she scoot over? I mean, he could have got on the board. Like, I did not get it. It was not emotional to me. I was mad. I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> Anyways. But you know how it goes, right? Sadly, the tragedy of the Titanic, the unsinkable ship, they struck an iceberg, and when they struck an iceberg, they began to take on water. And the way that it sunk is really something very, in some ways, kind of just sobering because the Titanic, the unsinkable liner of the time, actually came fully upright, right? And it then plunged into the depths of the icy waters of the Atlantic. And I'm sure most of you know that the vast majority of people on board the Titanic did not live. This is what isn't always advertised because it does speak to the depravity of humanity. Oddly enough, as I make fun of the movie, they did hint at this. When the Titanic began to plunge into the depths of the Atlantic, 1,600 people found themselves struggling in the icy waters of the Atlantic to fight off hypothermia. 1,600 people. What usually is not broadcast and advertised quite as much is that right around that 1,600 people, within seeing distance, within hearing distance, were 18 lifeboats that were only half full. 18 lifeboats, half full. They could hear the cries. They could see the struggles. Estimates are that if the 18 lifeboats, lifeboats would have turned around and filled themselves to capacity, another 540 people would have been saved. And instead of 1,600, right, it would be still a tragedy, but it would be 1,000 people. Of the 18 half full lifeboats, and the 1,600 people in the water, only 13 got saved because only one boat turned around. There's written record. I think it was boat number four. The people wanted to turn around, but the captain wouldn't. Boat number 12, the captain wanted to turn around, but the people threatened. 1,600 people, hopeless in an unfriendly sea. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt that way in life? Have you ever felt that you are, you've just been plunged, you, things were going well, but somehow you just got plunged into the icy waters of life and you're trying to fight off hypothermia? And you're suddenly in the unfriendly sea of a broken world, adrift and hopeless. And yet there's lifeboats all around. And you can see them. And you cry out, but, but no one seems to turn around, right? Have you ever been there? That's the reality of our life because of our hostility to God. But here's the beautiful parallel. That even though we're alienated, separated, hostile, to God and hopeless. There was a purpose to Jesus surpassing all other purposes. And it was to come on a rescue mission to bring to the Father everyone who would get in the lifeboat. And so when you flail in the waters of life, head barely bobbing above the waterline, hear me very clearly. There may be 17 boats out there not listening, but there's always one. And Jesus is the captain. 
and he will always turn that boat around. And his work on the cross was the turning of the boat. And he has commissioned to come our way. And he comes through the troubled waters of life on this preeminent purpose, reaching his arms out over the edge of the boat. But we have to reach up. Because between the verse that tells us that we're hostile towards God and the verse that tells us he presents us blameless, there's a human decision that has to take place. It's true we're hostile, and it's true that he's made peace through his blood on the cross, but we must choose to receive that peace. Otherwise, we stay in the icy waters. Otherwise, we stay at war with God. We stay hostile and his enemy. And for some of us today, what you need to understand is that there's a lifeboat circling you right now that you've never reached out to, and it's the lifeboat of Jesus. I, I said earlier that one day everyone will recognize the bigness of Jesus, and the Bible tells us so. Revelation tells us that in that day, everyone, in the end of, at the end of days, every creature, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow because Jesus is Lord. Everybody will do, everybody will recognize the preeminent person of Jesus. What, I, what I'm asking you today is have you made sure that you've recognized his preeminent pur purpose before that day comes? Well, I'm just checking things out. I'm just, you, you don't know how long you have to check things out, beloved. I promise you, every person in the room, watching online, wherever you are, every person will one day recognize the all-surpassing per person of Jesus. What you need to make sure is before that day comes, you recognize his purpose and reconciliation. So I'm going to ask our ministers to come forward, and we're about to sing this old hymn, Jesus Paid It All. And you know what he paid? He paid for you to get out of the icy waters of a broken world and into the lifeboat of Jesus. And it doesn't happen because you've done enough stuff. And it doesn't happen because, you know, you, you got baptized or you read the Bible. It only happens because you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this is what I'm going to do. Some of you are standing. That's fine. I didn't ask you to. You're just, you're just good listeners. You know what's, ha you know what's coming. That's fine. You can keep, you stay standing. But I'm about to issue a very specific set of instructions. If you are unsure if you have ever entered the lifeboat of Jesus, you need to know today. Because this is how it gets phrased. Sometimes we say, do you know that if you die today, you would go to heaven? There's nothing wrong with that question. But it doesn't just begin with that day because... You need to think that way. Do you, do you know today where your eternity is set for? But, but this is why I say it this way, because the lifeboat of Jesus, it gets you through this life. You, you get in right now, and it gets you through the waters of this life, and it carries you into the next. The lifeboat of Jesus sets sail for the destination of eternity. And if you are unsure if you have ever trusted Jesus with your eternity, if you've received him as your savior, you need to stand up right now and come forward. It's a very bold request I'm putting on you. But if you're unsure where you stand with Jesus Christ as your savior, you don't need to check things out anymore. You need to come know him personally. So I'm gonna ask you to get up and to come forward. As some people may begin to move, I'm gonna ask everyone to stand now. Because there's a lot of us, and the truth is, we've trusted Jesus for eternity. But you've just forgotten who he is, though. And you've let your problems, they're real problems. You've let your, your financial, your health, your relational, your hopes, your, you've let the struggles of life become bigger than the person of Jesus. And you've, you've got to get centered again. You've got to get reminded hear me, I say this all the time, following Jesus does not result in the absence of bad days. It just puts them in perspective. Because whatever your struggle is, how does it compare 
to the promise of Almighty God saying he will never leave you or forsake you. And so maybe for some of us, what you, you, everyone has a next step. Maybe for some of us, your next step is to come forward and to just hit this altar and to be prayed over and just be reminded of, of who Jesus is because you've lost sight of him. Yeah, you trust him with eternity. You just don't trust him with today. And he's made peace with the Father on your behalf, not just so one day you get to go to heaven, but that so today you can live like heaven. And so I'm going to pray, and as we sing the fact that Jesus has paid it all, if you want to come forward, this altar is open. There are men and women available to pray with you. And I say this again, if you are not sure where you are with Jesus, you don't need to stay still. You just don't. If you are unsure of your eternity, you need to come forward. And today you need to confess Jesus as your Savior And Lord, Father, this morning, as we cry out to you, Jesus, as we sing the fact that you've paid it all, I pray that you would do a powerful work. Father, I pray today that hope would be restored, not in ourselves, but in you. Father, I pray today in this moment, as we declare that you've paid it all, we would be reminded of the magnitude of who you are, Jesus. And so, Father, for marriages that seem hopeless, may may they be reminded of what can happen when you get in the middle of it. Of families that seem hopeless, may they be reminded of what can happen when you get in the middle of it. Of, Of what seems to be lost dreams. May our dreams become your dreams. In the midst of financial and health struggles, may we again come to realize, God, that you are bigger than these things. And yes, you may have for us some momentary afflictions, but you have promised us the weight of glory in all eternity. And may today that be the cry of our hearts. Father, would you transform us? Would you convict us? Would you bring salvation today to the hearts that cry out? It's in Jesus' name. Amen.